We are going to be talking next about food security and climate change. Um, and our moderator is Brooke Levon. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. I brought uh, 7 billion of my friends today to keep me company. Hi. I'll, I'll introduce you, don't worry. Uh, the panel, while they're getting settled, is uh, Aaron Makaruk. Hey, guys. And uh, Gregory Landau. Hey, everybody. And Kate McBride. And uh, Edwin Vardy. And Jerome Osentowski. And there's not name, there's not time to go into their bios, read their bios. Awesome. They're all doing very important work. Okay, just a minute. So, there, before, uh, th three hours ago, I. Uh, watched our cows come in, and we have, uh, we're milking 15 about 45 minutes from here. And uh, we have 240 acres that we're uh, working with. And uh, something's happened in the last decade there. We've been there for 15 years, and only 15 years, but we started to acknowledge the life in the soil and, uh, and all the plants, and we started to talk to them. Not like wobbly-headed spiritual, you know, just how you're doing. Hey, thanks for being there, and uh, let's work together. And so we did a lot of the horizontal stuff, the physical stuff, permaculture and rotational grazing, and all the right stuff. And we started to bring the soil back, kind of, it was in the degrade, we started to bring it level. And then we went a little vertical by acknowledging all the life. And they, I know, I know. Breaking news from the universe, they said, is that everything is alive. And the energy that we're looking for is really right before us. And 79% uh, of the air we breathe is nitrogen. And so if we work with the life and we turn our soils on, they know how to sequester that, and they know how to do that. My neighbors still go out and buy tons of synthetic nitrogen, and the impact on the environment is enormous, right? So the energy we're looking for is really right here, a lot of it, not all of it. We still burn a few dinosaurs. We have a tractor, too. So the people on the panel are going to talk, uh, do their part, and tell us a little bit about what they're doing. Um, but uh, come and see us. We're uh, just a short flight, 45-minute drive from here, and uh, you can come and see. And uh, we're serving about uh, 400 to 500 people with raw milk, uh, and the cows are not the problem, nor are the bison, nor are any of the animals. They're all here, and they have work to do if we would allow them to do their jobs properly. Copy? Copy. Okay. So Jerome is going to go first. Okay. Ready? Well, great. Uh, thanks for inviting me again. Um, this is a living laboratory. It's about uh, 20 minutes from here on the side of Basalt Mountain. And you see in the background, um, it's the Inner Pinion and Juniper Forest. But the foreground here is a 20-year-old food forest. Um, it's also it's a bio island. It actually creates a lot of habitat for all the insects and um, beneficial things that fly in, all the habitat. But we also get our food. Uh, we have two businesses that are incubated and operate out of here, uh, Ecosystems Design and uh, Jerome's Organics and a nonprofit that does the education. We have two for-profits, uh, Jerome's Organics and um, Colorado Pear. Um, one of my partners here is Vanessa Harmony. She runs the Edible Landscaping Nursery. So we have about 200 varieties of fruits and vegetables and medicines all in this desert environment. Uh, we're fortunate to have the water. Um, the greenhouses are um, backdrops for research for our, our, cons our consulting service. Uh, Michael Thompson is my partner in ecosystems design. Um, so we're creating a new economy here, and it has nothing to do with bitcoins. It has to do with a natural systems that you can actually take an acre and create a new economy. 
And that's what we're actually doing right here. Um, I'm 77. I'm going to be uh, turning this over to my new, to my partners. Um, and they're going to be running this place. Uh, we're sort of like the Polish RMI. Uh, you know, we, we've been along, around as long as Amory has, and, and we collaborate a lot. Um, but you know, we've done it with a shoestring economy and not too many, um, not too many resources. So the resources we use are the natural ones, just like the aspen forest. It doesn't have um, you know deadheading. It doesn't have fertilizers. Nobody should take any of the trees out. So the ducks on the on the on the left or on the right are, are actually um, are, are eating and swimming in their dinner. Okay, the the water that's circulating is coming in to aerate the pond. Um, then. We, do, we feed them uh, spent grain from the brewery. And that little house back there, now we have three ducks, and they're giving us duck eggs. So I use that nutrient-rich water to, f to fertilize all the. So we have a commercial compost tea machine, but we don't really need it. We can use the pond water. On the right, the ducks can go around and uh, eat slugs and fertilize. And uh, just on the other side, we have rabbits and chickens and turkeys. We have wild turkeys that we mentor. So this is an integrated, we have wild ducks that fly in and, and uh, um, nest in the pond. We have 40 turkeys that we mentor, mentor, and we have deer that we mentor on another area. So building soils is one of the intense things that we do. We do that in the pathways, but the entire place is a worm farm. We have four, three species of worms, but in the pathways of our greenhouse, we can generate, this is finished worm castings. And that sells pretty good at the pot market, but also we do our compost tea, we use it for our nursery, we could sell it, um, but every place is a worm farm. So we also build soils with, with huga culture, the way that natural systems build. So in some new beds that we, re we re revive from our fig tree, uh, we use wood in the bottom, then we lace different organic materials that we find or Bring in, and we can build soils, a millennium of soil, in a few hours. And then basically we just plant right into it. And we have this beautiful, in two months or a month and a half, we're eating a diverse uh, polyculture um, and creating medicines in that bed, as well as uh, we have echinacea and um, calendula and spilanthes, plus salad greens and medicinal herbs. We have a tropical greenhouse that we um, create a tropical environment with net near zero, net near zero energy with the climate battery technology that I helped develop over the last 30 years. And Michael Thompson has taken that to a whole nother level. So there's passion fruit there. There's tropical, maybe 70 different tropical medicines and fruits there on the, on the left. Uh, these are some of the outdoor Yields that we have, uh, over 150 varieties of stone fruits, uh, apples, plums, pears, mulberries, grapes, all on this desert environment, just by creating uh, these microclimates and doing that. So our, our main goal is to make this um, energy, uh, taking this, uh, this institute and turning it over to the next generation. And that's a challenge we have now in our transition plan. So we're looking for help to do that. Um, I want to take a couple of years off uh, before I'm 90 and enjoy life a little bit, sail a little bit more. And, um, but um, you know, it's, it's time is running out, so I want to make this transition as soon as I can. Hey, go ahead. Okay. No slides. You ready? I'm going to go after Flash? the slides. Okay. Didn't, didn't have have slides. We have a video. <clears throat> no, you guys good? I'll go after you guys. Cool. They queued up or not? Are they queued up? These yep, are beehives, okay. and this is Buzzbox. Buzzbox connects your beehive to the internet, letting you track the health and status of your honeybees. Buzzbox mounts easily to any beehive, is 100% solar powered, and streams live honeybee data to your smartphone. Buzzbox uses audio processing and artificial intelligence to keep track of your bees 24-7, so you can check in wherever you are with health notifications, data graphs, and audio playback.
Even without a BuzzBox sensor, you can still use our free app to record and analyze your honeybees using your smartphone. With the BuzzBox, you can monitor audio, temperature and humidity, and theft detection to keep your bees safe. All data is streamed to you wirelessly, and you can help teach the AI by providing in-app feedback, improving the system for everyone. You even have your own local weather station. So you know what's going on in here, whatever the weather. Join a global network of beekeepers using open technology and data to study and share new insights into these wonderful creatures. Let's learn to listen to our bees with BuzzBox. Yeah, so we, we know that 40% of all the colonies in the United States collapsed in 2017. And that's the problem that we're addressing. It's called colony collapse disorder. Um, it's generally caused because of a mixture of climate change, monocropping, overuse of pesticides. Um, so what we're doing is we built an AI system that's embodied in the buzz box, and it gathers sensor data, um, and we process all that audio, and we can detect different states within the hives in real time. And that's all transmitted to a phone so that if there's a problem, you know right away when that happens, and then you can intervene and <clears throat> Um, that's kind of step one. So we launched on March 30th of this year, and we have thousands of user, users in 20 plus countries. Um, we did a nine month pesticide study with the USDA Carl Hayden Bee, Bee Research Lab in Arizona. And um, we did like a, there are 24 hives in that experiment. And there was a control group and then different neonicotinoids, which are the main class of pesticides that are killing the bees were, were uh, introduced into the, all the colonies, and after the nine-month experiment, we did a blind analysis, and we were, we were able to detect with a over 90% accuracy rate which colonies were exposed to pesticides. So the promise of this vision is that um, with simple low-cost sensors like temperature and humidity sensors, microphones, we can detect when bees are exposed to pesticides. And so they then, um, let us know like when we need to intervene in the colony, try and save them, reduce the number of losses, but also bees themselves can now serve as kind of a sensor system within the environment worldwide, telling us where pesticides are being used, how much, how often they're being used. And with that data, maybe we can start to influence policy, maybe we can start to build relationships with local agricultural systems, farmers, talk to them about building collaborative ways of working through these problems rather than demonizing them. Like, for example, even if, pes if pesticides are used in the evening time or at night, that reduces the impact on bees alone. Just that little simple step can help and do a lot. Um, so this is like generation one of the technology. We, look, we are hoping to build something that can scale up for commercial honey producers. Um, we're envisioning something like by next spring that will be in the form of like a simple base station that can allow thousands of devices to connect to it so that we can outfit entire commercial apiaries with this technology. And that will not only help reduce the number of losses, but also commercial beekeepers generally kind of take a, an approach to the management of their colonies that's suboptimal -op in the sense that, you know, if they lose a few colonies, they don't really care. It's kind of a hang them and bang up approach. They're not using data to inform their management practices. So we think we can also optimize the way that commercial honey producers manage their apiaries. Um, we can reduce their expenses and help them make more money and, and make more money to uh, become more profitable. So maybe they can reinvest that into more healthier and sustainable practices. Um, so yeah, that's, good. that's kind of it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. That's, uh, well, I'm so grateful to be up here um, amidst such an amazing community and with such great speakers. Jerome has been an inspiration for a long time. Uh, I come from the world of permaculture. That's where I sort of cut my teeth as an entrepreneur and designer and teacher. And so I'm, yeah, just excited to be here. I wanted to sort of take a moment to reframe, you know, the panel. We're talking about food security, right? And so I'm going to do my best 
to ground what I'm talking about in that context and uh, provide a little bit of uh, story about work that I've done uh, in the global south, mostly with re uh, regenerative agroforestry systems. And I also want to bridge that to sort of the high-tech world that I'm working in right now. How many people here were uh, around last night for the blockchain conversations? Awesome. So really inspiring work and the work that's being done um, around monitoring the health of hives, around monitoring biodiversity. The same sort of technology, you can put a um, remote sensor in the Amazon and you can monitor what insects are, are, have a nocturnal activity. And you can correlate that to the botanical biodiversity. So you can understand what sort of impacts are being had via forestry. You can correlate that with remote sensing data from satellites. Um, there was a gentleman that asked about, you know, how are we measuring soil health and soil carbon? What does that look like? You know, there's um, amazing work being done by the Yale School of Environmental Studies around spectrographic analysis of soil, super cheap, super easy. You can tell immediately, essentially, how black is the soil. That's how much carbon is in it, essentially. So there's a, there's a real powerful um, emergence at the moment where uh, technology of a variety of different sorts is being used to gather information that we all used to understand more intuitively because it was a part of our culture as humans who lived a little bit closer to the earth. And so to me it's very exciting to sort of have this moment where technology and the technosphere is being grounded back in literally to the soil, where we can correlate soil moisture, soil connectivity, mycelial growth to the, the soil organic carbon and carbon sequestration rates. And what we're really working on at Regen Network is being able to um, create a new economy of value based on regenerating living systems. So in order to do that, you need to trust the information. You need the, the AI, the algorithm, the remote sensing, all of these things. We need to be able, to, they need to be open, they need to be transparent, they need, we need to, we heard Switch talking about data commons. We need to have this sort of, um, the lifeblood of the new economy is information and know-how. We were hearing the work that Jerome is doing, the work that Brooke is doing, this is not, uh, the technology is in sensing. The technology is in algorithms. The technology is in intelligence. The technology is not in monster combines, you know, and um, genetic engineering. The, the technology is, is subtle, and it's around reattuning our practices with the, the rhythms of natural cycles, right? And so in the South, to, to sort of cycle back really quickly and talk about what does it look like to sort of in that broader overview of, of um, an ecological knowledge economy in service to regeneration, um, what does that have to do with food security? Well, for a long time, farmers have had to make the choice, am I going to sell a single commodity at scale in order to you know, send my kids to college, or maybe not even, maybe just pay the light bills, or maybe just you know, slow in, slow, slowly slide into debt. Um, we have to crack the code for f local food security, biodiversity, um, healthy systems. There's a much more diversified economy, and that simply cannot be accounted for with a current petrodollar economy. It simply can't be accounted for when we have massive subsidies you know, flowing through back rooms that sort of mask the true cost of what's happening. You know, I guarantee the amount of abundance and food and um, monetary resources being generated by Jerome's you know, couple of acres in the high desert dwarfs an acre of what is considered to be the most productive farmland in the world in Iowa, right? So, Absolutely. And, and, that's, and there's food security in that, there's a diversity. And so the real question is, you know, do we have a will to value what, what is really being generated and to exchange based on that true cost and that true value? And so with that, I'll, I'll pass it along. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. you want to go last, Kate? Sure. Okay. So I'm honored to be up here. And be with such brilliant people. Uh, we work very closely with both Brooke and Jerome and Kate. 
So we've got kind of our little ecosystem of support network here in the Valley. And, and our work is really aimed at helping to make that more commonplace. Uh, bringing it back to food security, does anyone here know what the average age of a farmer is today? It's, it, it varies between 60 and 65, depending on what region you're in. But no matter how you slice it, 65 <laughs> is, uh, is not giving much space to the future of farmers right now. Does anyone know on the flip side of that, if you are a beginning farmer, the average income, the average net income of a farmer with 10 years of experience or less? less? $25,000 a year. So with $25,000 per year stepping into a field that is now pretty much governed by 65-year-olds, <laughs> In, a, in, a, in an economy that is really driving farm systems really extinct as we know it, um, it the, the problem becomes pretty substantial. Uh, to give a sense of scale of, of environmentally how this plays out, our, um, uh, the, uh, there was a, a, a report that recently came out by the World Resource Institute that measured all the global carbon emissions uh, from all the different sectors. Uh, on that report, agriculture was about 13.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions. That it, it measured separately land use change, which is predominantly agriculture. It measured separately transportation, which a substantial portion of which is to transport our goods to and from market. It measured separately chemical and fertilizer uh, manufacturing, which is essentially entirely around agriculture. And it measured separately manufacturing, refrigeration, storage, construction of the infrastructure that we have to uh, support our food system, and then the food waste that comes from the food system. When we put all those elements together, our global food system today and, and the way that we relate to food accounts for more than 50% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. So in other words, our biggest problem, our biggest challenge as a human race right now is the way we relate to food, something that we do hopefully about three times a day. The way I see it, food is, is kind of the, the basis of culture, right? Our, it's our third fundamental need after air and water. We don't have a tremendous amount of creativity around the air and water, but when it comes to food, it's, it's where we can kind of deliver a little bit of creativity into the equation. So to me, it's kind of the foundation of culture. So another way to say that is the foundation of our culture today is the leading cause of our challenges globally. And so where, that, where we can turn that around and where it's really exciting is, as, as uh, John so beautifully pointed out in the previous presentation, regenerative agriculture can actually do so much more good than just harm. It can actually turn it around. And all of our leading scientists are telling us that our most promising solutions for reversing the effects of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change rest in regenerative agriculture. So bringing it back to permaculture and food security, our number one problem, our number one challenge as a human species is also our number one solution, which is pretty exciting, I think. Yeah. You guys think it's exciting? Yeah. So, so we at the Farm Collaborative are, are aimed at, at really elevating that conversation. So we're located just at the base of, of Snowmass here, right at the turnoff of Brush Creek and Highway 82. And our facility is run like a town park, so please do come and visit. It's available for anyone to enjoy at any time, free of charge. Um, we run it like a farm park in that it's both a town park and a, a functioning farm at the same time. And uh, our, our intervention point is really at youth. So our support mechanisms are youth empowerment, and we, we really focus on connecting children and community to nature through farming and food. Um, and then, um, and so, so basically kind of creating that next generation of farmers to shift that gap of, of our, our challenge that we've previously mentioned. Um, and then also supporting those that are really doing it in farming right now. So we uh, launched a farmer incubation program that has um, uh, currently seven resident farms here in the valley, which is the majority of our local farms, um, that basically provides access to tools. So it's a, a tool share to help bridge the gap between being a startup farmer and making your farm successful. Um, we also are showcasing a, a, a diversity of demonstrative uh, and research-based tactics um, based in sequestra carbon sequestration. And we're measuring uh, rotational grazing versus alley cropping, which is a system of basically planting fruit trees uh, on contour of the land um, with uh, some annual or perennial fruit food production between them or uh, rotational grazing between them. Um, so we're measuring the carbon sequestration of all these different things to help basically spread the message on, on what is working best in our climate for shifting the paradigm and, and making our biggest challenge our greatest opportunity. And um, to, um, yeah, to, to sum that all up, I, I just want to invite everyone out and, uh, and 
share gratitude for all the amazing work that you guys are doing and that everyone here at this panel is doing. And just to, I guess, remember to keep optimism because uh, I think that it's, it's through optimism and through focusing on those solutions that we're going to make this all happen. Thank you. I'm on. <laughs> I'm Kate McBride with The Other Side Ranch. And I want to say first, I'm so grateful and honored and humbled to be here with all these great minds and speakers and all that they're doing. I came about this a little bit through the back door. Originally, I'm grateful for my father. We started a State of the World Conference, and we did that year in and year out. And um, that's how I met Chip in the first place. And I also come about this, uh, again, through the back door. I was uh, an athlete uh, for my lifestyle. And through the work from the State of the World Conference and my daughter, I have a special needs daughter, she was my signal, um, alert call to get involved in this. Many of you know uh, that know me, I am pretty much a Luddite nowadays. I find this digital abyss world that we live in, um, I, I <laughs> nicknamed it, um, I created a box for my father that sits at his front door and it's called the Digital Dumbing Device Depository. Mm -hmm. I feel kids these days grow up in these digital devices and they get dumber and they don't relate to one another. They certainly aren't sensitive to the outside world, to our animals that provide us food, just to the climate, et cetera, et cetera. So I come at this with the no, 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 hands up, crossed, X out, anything digital. And, and I say that with intention because with all this great new um, sensors and ways to connect us to our environment, it opens up a whole new world for me. And I'm grateful for those of you that can get through this thick skull to put a different light on the digital um, and it, if it can be used to these great ends, I think it's fantastic. So back to my daughter. My daughter it was perfectly normal baby. She was born um, naturally, et cetera, et cetera. At six months of age, she was diagnosed with interstitial lung disease, and she now has no immune system. The immune system came about because of the medications and the top down, we're going to suppress everything she has. There was very little attention to what she had. And I, as a mom, just could not accept. She was given three months to live at six months of age. And I said, no, thank you. Um, so I did everything I could to support my daughter. This is what brought me into a raw dairy. I provide a raw dairy. I also raise. Um, Berkshire pork dorper lamb for my daughter. My cows are Jersey. We, we know each other well with all of our practices. And uh, the doctors initially said, you are crazy. Raw dairy is dangerous. Um, everything should be pasteurized. And I said, no, 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 no. It should be pasture raised, not pasteurized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was met with such opposition, so I finally said to the doctors, here's my milk. This is what I've done with my cows. Um, test it. You say for yourself. And I requested they do a Sally Fallon test. Um, she's with the Western A. Price Foundation. And the doctors agreed. They took the raw dairy. And they infected it with all sorts of pathogens, upwards of 20, E. coli, Salmonella, Giardia, Candida, you name it, they put it in. They went back within the hour. They actually, 32 minutes later, they went to find what was in it. They couldn't find a thing. Mind you, we spent just under a year in the hospital with my daughter hooked up to all kinds of um, tubes, she's on oxygen 24-7, she was on a Metaport, she's fed through a G-tube. She's a walking cesspool of drugs. Um, in an environment with opioid epidemic, well, others think, well, just 
put her in a comfortable state and go on. I couldn't accept that. They, when they found nothing in the milk, they said, you know what, mom, you're on to something. I had the first Denver Children's site visit at the ranch, and I'm 25 minutes from here, ever. And the doctors came to me and said, you know, Kate, you're really onto something. We are allowing Annalisa, my daughter, to not only be out of the hospital, live at home, not have to return to the hospital one week out of every month to get hooked up and pump full of steroids and what have you, but also, she, so she could get her Metaport out, she's still on oxygen, she's still fed through a G-tube. They said, one of the best things you can give your daughter is raw dairy. One of the worst things you can give your daughter is pasteurized, homogenized dairy. And we are going to allow her to be discharged from the hospital, not return one week out of every month, on one condition. You continue your care exactly as it is, and you give her 85% of her calories through the raw dairy daily. That is currently her immune system. When dairy, correct me where I go wrong, Brooke, um, when milk comes out of the cow, 99.5 to 100.5 Fahrenheit, or refrigeration temperatures, it, well, that's the temperature that comes out of the cow. It's got everything in it, the good, the bad, the ugly. When um, it's in that temperature range or at refrigeration temperatures, then the good stuff really flexes its biceps. It's strong, it thrives, and when it's in the other temperature ranges, you let the milk cool down slowly when it leaves the cow, or warm up slowly as you remove it from the refrigerator, then it enters the temperature range in which the reverse is true. The bad stuff is really the big, bad, nasty demons. So those of us that we drink the milk in the two good ranges, immediately out of the cow or out of the refrigeration, if your farmer knows it's a temperature game, and they flash chill immediately, so you essentially take a snapshot of the ratio when it leaves the cow, then you and I, with a normal immune system, we mount an immune response to the bad stuff, which is like a skeleton of its former self. And therein, when we encounter the bad stuff as we walk in, around in life, we are armed with our soldiers. So this is what, um, really changed my world. Uh, the doctor went on to explain that raw dairy is the best thing for her, but pasteurized and homogenized dairy is the worst. That being said, why? When you pasteurize, you heat up the milk to such extreme temperatures, you kill everything. The good, the bad, you might as well eat the carton it came in, because you might, and if they fortify it with A and B, you'll get that. <laughs> um, if they homogenize it thereafter, they spin that milk at such high rates that they take those broken cells and it collides together to create a protein that doesn't exist anywhere in nature and is a toxin to us. So the doctor said to me, whatever you do, raw dairy is the best thing for her and if for some reason you cannot, then by all means, do not have it homogenized. Um, so that being said, I started a raw dairy. Um, I also, being a Luddite like I am, I wanted to do everything by hand. And I took, um, I took uh, cues from my daughters. My daughter was my big barometer, much like the bees are. And now my cows are. I have incorporated some new um, sensing digital technology, but mostly during parturition when my cows are in labor, I've got something called a moo call. <laughs> um, I'm being told I need to finalize. So um, the big picture for me is I've come into this uh, through the back door, through my barometer, my daughter. But my kids have also said, Mom, this isn't you. We need to keep full circle big picture. So everything that goes into us um, is what we are. 
But for us, it goes further than that. It's whatever goes into our cows, but also whatever comes out, the byproduct. We are a zero waste at my place, and we try to make sure that whatever comes out at all costs does not go into the landfill. So it's composted, recycled, etc. Everything is alive, and we destroy it before we put it in our bodies. Thank you. These are testimonials of a living system that's so brilliant that we were given. We don't respect, and we need to get back in relationship. The biggest problem, he said, is how we relate to, I'm going to change it to life. We're out of relationship with life. And the intelligence is in our relationships with all the living things. Copy? Copy. Okay. Uh, we got a few minutes for questions. I, one more thing. I know. So my seven billion friends here are telling me that I didn't introduce them properly and tell, tell you that they, when we moved to the ranch 15 years ago, our uh, organic matter was 2.5%. And this acre that we've been working on extensively, one acre for the, for the vegetables, is now at 11%. That's uh, basically virgin forest floor. Okay. And so I'm bragging for them, not for me. And uh, our pastures are almost 6%, up from 25 and the NRCS has been taking soil tests from us, um, <clears throat> the USDA, NRCS, for the last four years. And they wonder, what the fuck are you guys doing? <laughs> and we're being asked now to go lecture and talk. And uh, we're consulting. Next week, I go to eastern Nevada to work on 20,000 acres. So we're going broad scale. Okay. It's no longer nice little places, little farms and ranches or backyards, which is important. Um, I got a call from this Mormon guy, and he's ready. And he says in his heart he knows that the chemicals and the synthetics and the machines aren't right. And he has to pass that place to the next generation. And damn it, if he's not going to do it organic or biodynamic, it works. You can come down and see. You can come visit any of these people. It's working, and it does feed the people. Okay, questions? Mona? Got a mic? So I appreciate everything you guys have to say. Um, Brian Udall has introduced a, a comment, a new term, aridification. And the idea is that our soils are drying out, especially in the West. How does or can biodynamics and permaculture support drier soils? We still need water to raise crops, to feed animals, that kind of thing. How is there a way to use this, these to support this drying soil? Well, by building soils and mulching, I, we have a bumper sticker out that's called Make America Mulch Again. <laughs> Basically, you know, if we just mulched, if we didn't take all the organic matter to the dump, the re recycled pile, if we just put it in our backyards and our gardens, we'd be building soils for nothing. And that's what we do. You keep, keep the mulch on, then you use drip systems, uh, soaker hoses, uh, state-of-the-art irrigation systems, and you can conserve water, build soils, you also add the diversity element in there. Um, and then the biodynamic movement has lots of preparations. We use a lot of those, too. You can make, uh, if we, I have 200 comfrey plants. And the, yes, last night I was cutting it with a machete. They grow five, you know, this tall four times a year. That's animal food, fodder, the agroforestry systems are, with the alley cropping, you're growing your, util, you're growing your, 
your resources to make soil. You're chopping and dropping. You're feeding your animals. You're bringing your animals into agroforestry systems. So all of those things, um, Eric Tonsmeyer has written a book called Carbon Farming Solutions, and he wrote the chapters in Drawdown on agriculture. He was an intern at my place in the 90s for six months. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of connections there. So there's simple ways of building soil and keeping, uh, keeping the water down. The, the difference we have found is all of that, but also getting back in relationship with all of the life. And basically, they're the farmers. We're just the conductors in the orchestra, right? They're really doing all the work. And so what Jerome's talking about is creating the arena for nature and for the life to really do its best work. And what we're doing is not allowing it. We're, we're not creating the right arena. And so when we do that, we're getting back in relationship with them. And that's when things really start to move. Our, the soil tests are crazy. What would the NRCS is measuring how the different organisms in the soil respirate. And uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, they told me last year they have to make a bigger chart for us for this year's test. Can I add something to that really quick? Yeah. Moving on. So just to speak to that really quick and connect back to something that John was sharing, oh. it's really important to remember the small water cycle. So the reason that's, that there's aridification is because we're stripping the soil and the moisture is escaping and it's not coming back. So once you repair the healthy system with, in right relationship, you start to bring the water cycle back into a healthy state. You, the soil is a sponge, essentially. You can store a lot of water there. So just to connect back with that great, um, you know, you can research the small water cycle and you can talk to people about that from a scientific perspective. Yeah, the life holds the soil, or the, the life holds the water. And so when we don't take care of it, they retreat. Go ahead. Uh, yes, Richard Hasse with Clear Value. Um, the way that the Lord and the earth originally worked before man started doing it his way was that our wastes always contain our nutrients, and our wastes were supposed to be fertilizer for the next round of food. Now, of course, what we do today is we take our waste and we throw it in a landfill, and there goes all of our micronutrients. So we take the macronutrients from the chemical plants and we throw that in the soil, not replacing the micronutrients. So yes, as you say, we're depleting the soil. But let me propose, why cannot we remove the pathogens from our waste, which it does contain because we get sick every now and then and we want to pass it around. The vectors aren't good, right? Why can't we find a way to recycle nutrients, both macro and micro, the way the earth and Lord originally intended so that way we maintain our nutrients and don't throw everything in landfills. Thank you. We can, and to wrap it up, um, we're gonna raise the colors here, because we need a revolution. Yeah. Build soil, ladies and gentlemen, or die. Yeah. Raise the colors. Thank you all. Thank you, panel. Can I add one thing? I think it's really important that you mentioned filling the landfills. Um, one thing that we are all guilty of is, for instance, here in Aspen, our landfill is nearly full. And so many of us, we, don't, we try to eat everything on our plate, but then we are served too much or we don't eat it all. Those scraps go into the, the trash. That trash, food products, organic things, Anything uh, living going into the trash ends up being a huge contributor to methane gas. It doesn't decompose in the trash in our landfills. It does belong in the compost to regenerate our soils. I think all of us should make an effort to keep the cycles cyclical and do our part with not adding to our process convenience world, but to go back to the way it was meant to be, and we eat our waste um, should return to the soil, our food waste. Absolutely. <laughs>